wasn't fun. <laughs> Didn't come here. Um, thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you for being all in. Thank you, Catherine's Wave, for showing up. Yeah. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> Catherine's Wave, let me let you all in on a little something. So Jessica Carter, you all call her Jess. She and I went to high school together back in the day, and it's okay to call her Jessica, even if it annoys her. Um, <laughs> I'm, a high, I'm a big fan of that. No, we were, we were the best of buds back in high school. Um, guys, I want to pray for us, and then we will just jump right in. Lord, we love you, and we thank you, King Jesus, for you have risen Lord, we avail ourselves to you this morning. We ask you to speak to us, God. We ask you to open our hearts and our minds. Help us to hear the exact word that you have for each of us this morning. Pierce our hearts, God. Change us by your presence. We love you, Lord God, and we bless you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Y'all, I need to tell y'all about little Johnny. Little Johnny was afraid of the dark. He was afraid of the dark. And one night, his mother told him, go out there to the shed and get me a broom. Little Johnny turned to his mother and he said, Mama, I don't want to go out there. It's dark. The mother looked reassuringly at her son. She said, don't be afraid of the dark, son. Jesus is out there and he will be with you and he'll protect you. Little Johnny looked at his mother in a confused state, and he asked, Mom, are you sure Jesus is out there? She said, yes, I'm sure. Jesus is everywhere, and he will always be with you and help you in your time of need. So little Johnny began to think about this. He began, the, the wheel started to turn, and suddenly he had a great idea, and he looked at Mom and he said, okay, Mom, I'll handle it. So he goes to the back door, he opens it up just just a little bit, he peers out into the darkness, and then he yells, hey Jesus, I know you're out there, can you bring the broom from the shed? (laughs) If your neighbor didn't get that joke, just pray for him, just pray for him. It's amazing that the presence of the right person drives away fear. When I was growing up, I was scared of the dark, and I'd go get, up, get my mother up out of a dead sleep, had no idea how frustrating that must have been to my dad, <laughs> but suddenly the boogie monster would be rendered powerless. The boogie monster has no power in comparison to a mama's love, right? Sometimes having the right person there makes all the difference in the world. Wouldn't it be nice in our grown-up world with so much fear and distrust if the right person would show up? Distrust seems so high, and for many of us today, real relationships seem hard. Many in our culture have locked ourselves into what the culture now calls an epidemic of loneliness. And with that in mind, as I consider the passage from John's gospel, I'm drawn to the image of these disciples in locked rooms for fear of the Jewish leaders. They saw the religious leaders had taken Jesus. They had handed him over to the Roman officials to be executed. And so it makes perfect sense that they're behind locked doors and holed up in a room. But it reminds me that when we are afraid, we are often tempted to shrink life down to what we feel like we can control. Amen all by myself. In a modern world of competing reports and opinions, we find trust increasingly difficult. Socially mediated relationships feel safer than face-to-face conversations. And as distrust grows, the propensity to make our world small also grows. Putting life on lockdown offers the false illusion of control, but at what cost? At the cost of living in fear and isolation. What if the resurrected Jesus, 
the fully alive, death-defeating, fully God, fully man person of Jesus invites us to live, to truly live outside of the confines of fear and false security and into the joy of a vibrant life. Let me say this. If you're here at church and church is not a normal part of your life, I want you to know we're just really grateful you're here. I also want you to know that if you find it difficult to believe that someone has died and they have defeated death and now they're alive again, if you find that difficult to believe, I get it. I know that's a stretch. And so I just appreciate the fact that you're willing to listen to this and give it a fair hearing. Friends, it is very common and rightly so to preach that the gospel is about how Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. And surely at the cross, Jesus did atone for human selfishness and self-centeredness. But what often gets overlooked is Jesus didn't just deal with sin at the cross. He also dealt with the curse at the cross. You may be thinking, well, Chris, what is the curse? The curse is the internalized lie that God can't be trusted, so I have to figure out how to make life work on my own. And you know what happens when I try to make life work on my own? Fear happens. The price of believing the internalized lie that God can't be trusted and that I'm really on my own, the price of that is perpetual dis-ease or fear. In the good seasons, the fear is fairly low grade, but in the, the hard seasons, the fear can feel crippling. So Jesus didn't just deal with sin so that one day I'd go to heaven when I die. He dealt with the curse so that I could live in peace and joy in this life. Friends, that's good news. For these disciples, the way he dealt with the curse was by showing up, by being the right person in their time of need. He comes through the doors of their fear-soaked room and says, peace be with you. And as I said earlier, the presence of the right person makes all the difference in the world. When I was growing up, the Chicago Bulls were better than sliced bread. Anybody remember the Bulls of the 90s? Yeah, there we go. They won the 91, 92, and 93 NBA championships. But then someone senselessly murdered Michael Jordan's father, and he retired for two years. During those two years, the Bulls did not win any championships. But then he came back out of retirement, and they won the 96, 97, and 98 NBA championships. Those two three-peats tell us that the presence of the right person can frankly be the difference between defeat and victory. So in the presence of the risen Lord, Jesus takes the disciples from fear to faith. He takes them from locked rooms to a bold witness that will frankly cost them their lives. So today, I want to look at three ways that the life and the presence of Jesus moves us from the internalized lie that God can't be trusted. I'm really on my own to a life of faith and joy. Firstly, Jesus overturns the curse by the example of his own life. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before his crucifixion, he rejected the lie that God couldn't be trusted by frankly entrusting his entire life into the hands of God. His willingness to say, not my will, but but yours be done, God, even in the midst of the fear of great suffering and death, begins to overturn the curse. The writer of Hebrews says that for the joy set before him, think about that, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you see this is a completely new line of reasoning? This is not fear and self-protection. This is self-giving and bold faith. Many of you have probably heard the first couple of lines of the famous serenity prayer by Reinhold Niebuhr. God, 
Grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. A couple of years ago, someone introduced me to the rest of that prayer. It is a powerful and beautiful prayer. It ends with these couple of lines, trusting that he, trusting that Jesus will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I might be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever. Trusting, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will. Friends, that's what Jesus did, right? He trusted that the Father would indeed make all things right if he leaned into his will. And so early Friday morning, while Jesus was still in the Garden of Gethsemane, the religious leaders arrested him. They had him tried by a kangaroo Roman court. They distorted justice, beat him mercilessly. And then Jesus was publicly hung naked on a tree. He was stretched out on a cross with nails driven through his hands and feet. Hear me on this, friends. Until Jesus, human history was frankly a sad history of people distrusting God. Let me say that again. Until Jesus, and frankly, sadly, beyond Jesus... Most of history has been humans distrusting God. And that distrust led to what John Milton called paradise lost. Jesus, in the midst of not paradise but hell on earth, chooses to trust God. He rejects the lie of distrust, gives himself to the Lord. And in that trust, guess what happens? Paradise starts to be regained. So he overturns the curse By the example of his life. Secondly, he overturns the curse by his physical resurrection. Through what is called Holy Saturday, the disciples waited while Jesus' body laid in a tomb that was guarded by a huge rock and Roman centurions. And then early in the morning light on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene found an empty tomb. And she found the body of Jesus not dead, but more alive than it had ever been. Jesus being physically alive sets us free from fear. Why? Because it tells us that death is not the final word. Look at your neighbor and go, death is not the final word. (laughs) Have you ever noticed that... Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go today. (laughs) Why is that? One of the reasons why I suspect that is true is because we weren't made for a disembodied existence. We were made for hugs and high fives. And so we don't naturally look forward to a life of floating on the clouds like ghosts. It just seems a little better than the alternative. Friends, the resurrection proclaims that at the end of all things, for those who have surrendered to Jesus as their Lord, there's not a disembodied existence at all. It's an embodied existence. There will be hugs. There will be high fives. We will throw footballs. And yes, we will even dance. Don't tell the Baptist. <laughs> Let me say this. For some of you, it would be the first time you've danced with a sense of rhythm in your whole lives. <laughs> So in the midst of a fearful world, the bodily resurrection of Jesus boldly says, take a deep breath, relax. You don't have to get it all done in this life. This is only the beginning, what C.S. Lewis calls the title page. So Jesus 
deals with the lie by being physically raised from the dead. But thirdly, he overturns the curse of the internalized lie by ascending to the throne of God. If you've ever found, felt crazy, which if you go to Mosaic, you've probably felt crazy at one time or another. <laughs> Mary Magdalene it brings us good news. She was demonized by seven demons. But notice on this resurrection morning, she's not hiding behind any locked doors, right? She is going to the tomb. She wants to find Jesus dead or alive. And indeed, she finds the risen Jesus. And he tells her, don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. N.T. Wright, the scholar, observes that this wasn't a prohibition against touching Jesus. This was simply Jesus making her aware that the new relationship with him was not going to be like the old relationship with him. In the old relationship, Jesus had a finite body. So if he was in Samaria, he wasn't in Jerusalem. If he was talking to Peter, he wasn't talking to a Roman guard. But now Jesus tells Mary, go to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to the Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Notice he's saying, look, the relationship that I have with the God the Father, you're basically going to have a very similar one to me. That's incredible news. You see, the ascension doesn't simply mean Jesus went to heaven. No, it means that he is now seated on the throne and that all authority belongs to him. What is more, it also means that now, in his ascended state, he can be present to all of us at the same time. He's not just in Jerusalem, but not in Samaria. No, he can be present to all his people at all times. So, let me say this. In the light of the ascension, the cure is the internalized conviction that Jesus is here and he can be trusted so I never have to do life on my own. Let me say this is good news. For those of us who are single, it's good news because it can be a lonely life, but we never have to do it alone. For those of us who have been in hard marriages, that's its own brand of loneliness. But loneliness never means we have to do life alone because of the presence of Jesus. Folks, if the curse is an internalized lie, the cure is an internalized truth. And so Jesus breathes on his disciples. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And so God's very presence begins to be internalized in us for those of us who will choose to surrender to Jesus as their king. So that his presence begins to take away the lie and restore the truth that I never have to do life on my own. I am deeply loved. I don't know about you, but I have real compassion for Thomas. He's often called Doubting Thomas. But maybe a more accurate title for him would be Absent Thomas. Right? He believed in Jesus enough to follow him for three years to kind of quit whatever he was doing and, and walk with Jesus day in, day out for three years. So he believes in Jesus, but he was simply absent when Jesus showed up to the other disciples. And in the midst of the horrifying circumstances that had just transpired, his faith leaked. Come on, y'all. Yeah. How many of you know what it's like to have difficult circumstances and discover your faith beginning to leak? Friends, knowing Jesus, experiencing Jesus, not simply knowing about him, that's what frees us from the curse. Mm -hmm. That's why experiencing Jesus in a personal way internalizes the conviction, internalizes the conviction that he's here and I can trust him. And this is why Jesus is breathing on the disciples. He wants them to receive the Holy Spirit because God is inviting them and frankly God is inviting you 
into this experience of Jesus that is a day-in, day-out experience and begins to transform our lives. Pardon the, the crudeness of this analogy, but Jesus' peace is much more like Zoloft than a fairy godmother. Now, you may be thinking, Chris, did they teach you that in seminary? That's... They did, they did, and that was free. <laughs> you, can, you can take that, you know, at, at lunch today. Well, what did you learn at church? Well, Jesus' peace is like Zoloft. <laughs> I want Jesus to be like a fairy godmother. I want him to wave a wand and suddenly all my fear is gone and it's permanently so. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not how it works. For those of us who have known what it's like to need some medication because we have an anxiety caused by a chemical issue. We know what a great blessing medication can be. But we also know you have to take it every day. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Through his Holy Spirit dwelling in me, I can have an ongoing relationship with Jesus that breeds peace in my soul. Ultimately, that's how the truth that he is with us and that he can be trusted gets internalized. And ultimately, that internalized experience of Jesus is the cure. Yeah. Just like mama showing up when you're scared of the dark, that's the cure, the presence of Jesus. So my question for you today is, where are you? For some of you, you, you might consider yourself a seeker. And as a seeker, you might be saying, Chris, this is the first time I've been to church in a long time, maybe ever. And I, I like what you're saying, but I'm not sure I believe any of it. I want you to know I, I really get that. And I just appreciate you being here. I want to offer a couple of ideas as next steps. If, if you're seeking, understand that the resurrection of Jesus is a historical claim, not just a religious claim. It's a historical claim. So I would really encourage you to study it historically. Because either he has literally overcome death, and it can be historically um, revealed. Or his bones are in a tomb someplace and he's a liar and you don't need to believe in him. So I would encourage you, if, if you're seeking, study the resurrection. And if you have questions about like some things to look up, some, some texts to look at, well, let me know. I'd love to talk to you about that. But I would also say this. If you're seeking... It is okay to belong before you believe. It really is okay to belong before you believe. And we would love to kind of show you how to belong so that you begin to experience Jesus. Because frankly, it, it is the experience of Jesus that will really change your heart. Really transform your life. Some of you may be mental believers but not yet followers. Like you believe Jesus is who he says he is, but you have not given him your allegiance yet. Friends, the writer of John is very clear. He wants you to have a rich quality of life that comes from taking Jesus at his word. That comes from truly surrendering your life to Jesus. And so if you're there, if you believe in Jesus, but you've never really surrendered to him as Lord, I would just say this, like Thomas Stop doubting and believe. Surrender. Let him begin to work in your life. For others of you, you might be what we call in the absent Thomas Club. You believed in Jesus. You've given your life to him. But that consistent encounter with Jesus has been lacking. And as a consequence, fear has begun to, to really govern your interiority. Friends, at Mosaic, we believe that a disciplined spiritual life comes in community. And so we, if you want to begin to encounter Jesus consistently, we'd love to talk to you about how to do that. 
So whether you're a seeker or a believer, but not yet a follower, or in the absent Thomas Club, or if you're really going after Christ and like learning how to walk with him, you may be asking, Chris, where do I go to find Jesus? You'll find him when you get honest about your locked rooms. I want you to stand with me. Friends, for some of us, the locked room is the room of numbing. We've learned how to numb the fear through binge-watching Netflix, messing around on our cell phones. Some of us have done harder things, like Laura. We've, we've messed around with drugs and alcohol, just trying to numb the fear. For some of us, our locked room is ambition. Laura made a great point. She said, we're more alike than you realize. For some of us, we just have believed that if we can get the career we want, we'll finally be able to control things and have the life we dreamed of. If you've gotten that dream career, you know that wasn't actually what your heart longed for. For some of us, it's the locked room, and hear me on this, Evans, Georgia. For some of us, it's the locked room of family idolatry. It's, if my kids make a honor roll, I will be happy. Or if I can just make mama happy, I'll be happy. And lastly, for some of us, the locked room is anger. We've never really figured out how to deal honestly with our anger based on past hurts. And as a consequence, we carry resentments and anger permeates a lot of our current relationships. Or maybe it's the locked room of anger in your living room, watching things that you can't control and just getting mad. Friends, here's the scary thing about locked rooms. At first, we lock them. But then we get so addicted to the security that they seem to offer us that those locked rooms become prison cells. And we begin to live out the words of Hotel California. You can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. And friends, while we can't get out of the prisons of our own making, the ascended Jesus can pass through our locked doors. So I encourage you, get honest with Jesus about your locked rooms. If it's mindlessness, trying to numb pain through addictions and uh, social media, or if it's cutting or if it's looking for love in all the wrong places. Or if it's trying to control things you can't control and feeling angry. Invite Jesus into the locked room. If you'll get honest with that, what is his by nature becomes ours by grace. At the cross, Jesus paid everything. He accomplished everything necessary for us to live in peace. And in rest. Not just so that we would go to heaven one day, but so that we could live in peace and enjoy today. So I implore you, invite Jesus into your locked room. I'm going to invite our prayer ministers down. And I encourage you just to bring your locked room to them. Let them pray with you. Or if you just have some other need that you just want somebody to pray with, uh, pray with you about, just come down and let them pray. Friends, the person, the right person has come. And he can show us how to live in peace and rest. Jesus is the cure. He's here and he can be trusted. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Jesus, you are here. And you can be trusted. You are so good.
Lord, would you do a deep inner work in us? Would you pass through our locked doors? Would you turn the lie upside down and turn us right side up? That we would believe that you are with us and that you can be trusted so that we never have to do life on our own. Lord, if you would pour that into our hearts, we would be so grateful. We love you and we thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.